Hi, my name is Meg Graff. I am a board member for the Illinois chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I also serve as the chairperson for the Outreach and Education Committee. Um, before I start, I want to ask you all to sign in and feel free to grab a lunch. On the back counter, we have a lot of information for a lot of our different programs. Quick commercial, we have Survivor of Suicide Day coming up in two weeks. So if you've lost someone and you want to get treatment with in a group setting, that would be in two weeks. And we also have the biggest um, community walk for suicide prevention in the country. We just had it two weeks ago. If you want to pre-register for next year, that form is also on the back. I would now like to introduce Dr. Sally Weinstein. She is one of the grant recipients for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Her study focuses on pediatric bipolar and suicide prevention. All right, thank you. And thank you for coming today. Um, so as Matt mentioned, my name is Sally Weinstein. I am a clinical psychologist and an assistant professor here at UIC, so it's nice to be on my home turf. And I'm going to share with you about my Young Investor Grant today, uh, which is titled Identifying Psychosocial Risk Factors and Intervention Methods to Prevent Suicide in Pediatric Bipolar Disorder. Um, you'll also hear me refer to pediatric bipolar disorder as PBD throughout the lecture today, just for short. Before um, I get to what I'm going to talk about today, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got interested in this work. Um, I'm part of a team that works with kids with bipolar disorder, and I'm working on a large study that looks at how we treat these kids and how to develop better treatment methods. Um, the study is not focused on suicide or suicidality, but in doing this work, uh, when I first came to UIC, I was responsible for assessing these kids before they started the study. And we had a screening measure for suicide to make sure that the kids were not too high risk to enter our study. Um, and what I noticed was that so many of these young kids, and we have a young sample, it's ages 7 to 13, so many of these young kids were endorsing um, current or past suicidal thoughts or behaviors. And so I thought, we have to be studying this. We need our study to focus on this better. And so that led me to develop this proposal um, that I submitted to AFSP and started last year. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what I've done with that work so far. So in today's talk, first talk about why this is important. Why are we focusing on kids with bipolar disorder? And I will provide some background on what we do know and what we don't know about suicide risk and treatment for these kids. And then in the second part of my talk, I'm going to focus on, so what am I doing about it? Um, and talk about my study goals and design. And as I mentioned to some of you before the talk, um, I'm only in the very beginning of year two of my grant. So this is very much a work in progress. Everything I'm presenting today is very preliminary. I'll talk to you about the intervention that we've developed for kids with bipolar disorder and how I propose to adapt it for suicide prevention. And then I'll present to you some very preliminary data on the sample to date, sort of show you where I'm going with these analyses. So I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but suicidal behavior in the United States is a significant public health concern, uh, leading the Institute of Medicine to declare the need for war on suicide and deeming suicide prevention efforts a national imperative in this 2002 publication. And among children and adolescents in particular, suicide is a public health concern, breaking as the third leading cause of death among children and adolescents in the United States. Among kids, youth with bipolar disorder are at particularly high risk for suicide, with risk for and mortality from suicide that exceeds any other childhood psychiatric disorder. And in fact, findings suggest that up to 50% of these youth will make a suicide attempt by age 18. Yet despite these really tragic rates, uh, very little is known about the risk and the protective factors for suicide in this population. And even less is known about intervention for these kids. <clears throat> so the goal of my study was really to advance our understanding of suicide risk and treatment for this population to inform suicide prevention interventions and hopefully help us work towards reducing that morbidity associated with the disease. 
But just to put some of my work in context, I wanted to start with some background on pediatric bipolar disorder, um, because I know we all come here with differing uh, backgrounds in what we know about this disorder. So what is pediatric bipolar disorder? It's a mood disorder. It involves episodes of mania, depression, or mixed episodes, which include elements of both mania and depression. And it's considered a spectrum of disorders with subtypes of bipolar type 1, type 2, or not otherwise specified, depending on the severity and the duration of those mood episodes. Uh, research has really uh, supported the notion that pediatric bipolar disorder is a brain disorder. And by that I mean that studies have shown that there are identifiable differences in the wiring and the functioning of certain parts of the brain, particularly the parts that help us manage and regulate emotions, the cognitive and the emotional control centers of the brain, or the frontal limbic pathways. Um, and these differences in the brains that we see in kids with bipolar disorder compared to their counterparts without the disorder really help explain the difficulties that we observe in their experience and regulation of their emotions. Pediatric bipolar disorder, or the, the disorder that onsets in pre-adolescent kids, tends to present quite differently uh, from those who experience a later adolescent or adult onset. Some of the unique features that we see in these kids and that have been shown in the literature are first in terms of the mood symptoms. These kids present with much more prominent irritability or mixed episodes of depression and mania compared to older adolescents or adults. In addition, we also see far greater mood instability. Um, and sometimes these kids can cycle up to once per day between those mood states. Whereas in adults, we tend to see uh, more discrete periods of mania and depression with periods of relative stability in between. Uh, with kids, the picture is sort of day-to-day -day fluctuations. And then in kids, we also see uh, high frequency of co-occurring childhood disorders like ADHD, anxiety, and oppositional defiant disorder. Um, another thing about bipolar disorder that our research has shown is that these kids and their families tend to experience significant stressors, uh, both in the home and at school, leading to impairment across numerous life domains. So we see high rates of family conflict and parenting stress, uh, peer difficulties, rejection or hypersensitivity to peers. We see a lot of difficulties in the school setting, both academic and behavioral problems. And we tend to see uh, difficulties with low self-esteem and poor coping skills in the kids themselves. So this is a disorder that has a profound impact on the children and their lives um, and their families. And also, as you can tell from what I've described, it's a pretty complex clinical picture. And the complexity of that clinical picture has led to a lot of confusion over the years and controversy. Um, this is definitely a field that is plagued by controversy, confusion, and stigma, as recent book headlines like this illustrate. And these headlines are not surprising. Um, not only is this a complicated diagnosis, but perspectives um, on the nature um, and prevalence of this disorder have really shifted quite dramatically over time. So historically, a prepubertal onset of bipolar disorder was considered to be rare or non-existent. But in the past decade, we have seen clinical diagnosis rates really um, increase 40-fold. And so this creates a lot of questions and confusion. Is this a new problem? Is this something that was misdiagnosed before? Or are we misdiagnosing it now and overdiagnosing it? Um, so it creates a lot of questions. But Research has really helped us clarify some of these questions. And a recent study that was a meta-analysis of over 16,000 youth in the United States and abroad, and a meta-analysis just meaning sort of a study of studies, showed that the rate of bipolar spectrum disorders in this age group was about 2%. And what's interesting is that rate is very similar to the prevalence for adult bipolar disorder. In addition, in retrospective studies where adults with bipolar disorder are asked to think back to when they first recall experiencing their symptoms, about a third recall that their symptoms began before adolescence. Um, and so the take home here is really that 
the data support the existence of pediatric bipolar disorder. This is a real problem, and so our research really needs to be focusing on the early identification and intervention for these youth. Now, why is that important? As with any other disorder, um, symptoms worsen when they are left untreated or when they're incorrectly treated because of misdiagnosis. And for kids with bipolar disorder, this can have pretty powerful long-term consequences, um, including repeated hospitalizations, school dropout or school failure being fairly common, um, and high rates of substance use, and then of course most relevant to this talk today, uh, attempted and completed suicides. And early intervention and prevention can go a long way to preventing these outcomes, um, and that's where the work like this comes in. So how do we go about preventing these consequences, particularly suicide for these kids? At first, we really need research to understand what are the factors that explain the high risk for suicide in this population? And even more importantly, what are the factors that increase risk that we can also change through treatment? So knowing that um, perhaps gender or age makes you high risk for suicide is less helpful for treatment efforts. But if we can target the factors that are actually amenable to change, that's where we can make a difference. And like I mentioned in the beginning, there's not very much research in this area. It's really still in its infancy um, on pediatric bipolar disorder in general. But research has highlighted a couple of promising area uh, avenues for future intervention. So one area that's been shown to relate to suicide risk um, is family stress. So family stress, conflict, and low adaptability in families has been shown to relate to suicidal ideation in kids with bipolar disorder. In addition, cognitive risk factors, so things like difficulties with problem solving, low self-esteem, or hopelessness, have also been shown to relate to suicidality in kids in general, although it's unknown how this relates to risk um, in kids with bipolar disorder specifically. And then last, work with adults with bipolar disorder has shown that greater mood instability, so more fluctuations between mood states, um, leads to increased suicide risk. But again, this hasn't been examined in you. These are all areas that um, are very common in pediatric bipolar disorder. I mentioned them as some of the unique features of the disorder, um, difficulties in the family, um, difficulties with cognitive factors, and high rates of mood instability. And so it's very plausible that many of these factors may relate to the high risk for suicide in this group. And knowing this is really important because then um, it offers points of intervention and how we can, in turn, start to target some of these areas of risk. Um, as I mentioned, there hasn't been any work that's really looked at this in kids with bipolar disorder, but there has been some promising work for adolescents uh, with depression or bipolar disorder. So there's a big study called the Treatment for Adolescent Suicide Attempters that has focused on some of those cognitive risk factors that I mentioned, like problem solving and coping skills, and shown some promising results. And there's two different treatments for teens with bipolar disorder, um, one that targets more family factors and one that really focuses on mood instability that has shown some promising work for suicidality in these older kids. Um, but as I mentioned, these interventions for children in early adolescents with bipolar disorder have not been examined in any systematic way. So what do we do about this group? As a start, Existing treatments that have been developed for this age group may be a good place to guide suicide prevention interventions. And one of the few evidence-based and empirically supported treatments for this age group is called Child and Family Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CFFCBT, or Rainbow Therapy. And this is a treatment that we've developed um, in our program here at UIC. And it's designed to be an adjunct to medication, specifically for this school age group um, of kids with bipolar disorder in their families. Now this treatment is not designed to address suicidality, but the core treatment components that I'll describe in detail today 
targets some of those possible risk factors. It targets family functioning, child cognitive risk, and mood regulation. And so an important question is, does this treatment reduce suicidality for kids with bipolar disorder? And if so, how? What are the mechanisms that we see changing in this treatment that relate to change in suicidality? So that led to this study. Um, and so to build on previous research on kids with bipolar disorder and also suicide, uh, the first goal of this study is just to identify what are the risk factors associated with suicidality, uh, suicidal ideation and behavior in pre-adolescents with bipolar disorder that may be targets for treatment. And what I expect going into this work is that these suicidal events will be associated with family risk, child cognitive risk, and affective risk, uh, greater mood instability and impulsivity. The second goal of this study is to explore if and how our treatment that we've developed for these kids may also generalize to the treatment of suicidality and may prevent or reduce suicidal events as compared to a control treatment. And the questions that I have here are, do youth receiving this treatment experience greater change in suicidality versus the control? And in particular, do changes in these identified cognitive, family, and affective risk factors lead to changes that we may see in suicidality through treatment? And then the final goal of the study is to use these findings to then develop a targeted suicidal event reduction treatment module for PVD youth, or SURE for short. Um, and really the design and the use of this module will be dictated by my study findings. Um, and will aim to target the key factors that we identify that are related to suicide risk in this uh, group in particular. And then I would aim that this treatment could be developed as an add-on module to our existing treatment uh, to target suicide prevention but also that one day this is a treatment that could be transported to community settings as an acute standalone treatment as well. And testing this module is sort of outside of the scope of my Young Investigator grant, but it's really the goal of this grant is to end up with this module that I would test in future work. Okay, so moving on to how I am actually going about uh, meeting these goals. So this study is being conducted as a complementary study to an ongoing NIH-funded randomized clinical trial that's examining the efficacy of this treatment that I've described, CFF-CBT, versus a control treatment for pediatric bipolar disorder. And this study is being led by Dr. Amy West, who's also here at UIC. And so the goal of my study is to expand the sample of this trial by an additional 30 youth to give us enough kids and enough what we call statistical power to look at suicide, suicide risk before and after treatment. Um, this study, the larger trial, has been going on for five years, and it's actually over right now, but we're continuing to recruit just for the purposes of my AFSP project. So the sample of my project is a target N of 90. Um, the sample of the study was 60, and so we're expanding that by an additional 30. And it includes kids ages 7 to 13 with a bipolar spectrum diagnosis. And we primarily recruit here um, at the Pediatric Mood Disorders Clinic, but also get some referrals from local child hospitals. Just briefly about measures. Um, we assess all kids to confirm their diagnosis of bipolar disorder at the beginning of the study, and we do something called the WASH UK SADS, and that is just a uh, structured interview that we give to the child and the parents that's sort of the gold standard for making the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, we look at suicide using a rating scale called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, and that is administered by a clinician, so it would be administered by myself or one of our other study personnel, with the child, and it asks about types of suicidal thoughts, ranging from passive thoughts of, I, I wish I was dead or it would be better if I wasn't alive, to more severe thoughts with a specific plan and some intent to act on those thoughts. And it also looks at types of suicidal behaviors. 
actual attempts, uh, preparatory behaviors, or interrupted or aborted attempts. And then in addition to looking at suicide, we also look at those family cognitive and affective risk factors that I was talking about using a variety of different measures. And also we look at demographic and clinical factors that may relate to suicide risk as well. And then um, the main thrust of this study, though, is this intervention. Um, and for the clinical trial, families are randomly assigned, so a coin toss, to see which condition they wind up in, to either receive our um, experimental treatment, which is CFF-CBT or Rainbow, or the control. And so the experimental treatment is a manualized protocol that's delivered in our specialty clinic uh, for kids with mood disorders. And so it's delivered by either myself or trainees that work under me and who are trained in this treatment model. In addition, families may be assigned to the control treatment as usual. And for this, families are assigned to a practitioner in our general child and family clinic here at UIC. So still a high level of care, but it's someone who is not specialized in mood disorders and is not familiar with our specific rainbow protocol. Across treatments, um, all families receive the same number of sessions. They receive 12 weekly sessions and then six monthly booster sessions. Um, and because most kids with bipolar disorder um, are also receiving medication, all the youth who are receiving medication are uh, seeing one of the providers in our specialty clinic. And the, the medication is not a focus of our trial, although we certainly track it. And then the participants are looked at before and after treatment, and then at a six-month follow-up. So what I thought would be most interesting to talk about today, uh, since I don't have a ton of data to present yet, is to tell you a little bit about this intervention that we've developed for kids with bipolar disorder, and then how we propose to, or how I propose to adapt it for suicide prevention. Um, so I know we have some clinical folk in the audience here, um, but just stop me at any time if you have questions about the treatment. Just a little bit about the model of our treatment. As I mentioned, it's considered to be adjunctive to medication, and that's following the practice parameters for kids with bipolar disorder that suggests that psychosocial therapy is an important component of a multimodal treatment approach. This treatment has also been designed to be developmentally specific for this pre-adolescent age group and involves intense work with the parent and families alongside working with the child. And the format is that this is a manual-based treatment, so um, it's sort of a protocol or a curriculum that the clinician is following with the families. Um, as I mentioned, it involves 12 sessions that occur weekly and then six monthly booster sessions, and the sessions alternate between working with the child, working with the parent, and working with the family. So this treatment is cognitive, behavioral, and focus. Um, that's the treatment orientation that it's grounded in. But it also includes elements of other successful treatments, um, including education, uh, mindfulness, and interpersonal therapies um, that are kind of woven in throughout the treatment. And this is very much an evidence-based treatment. It is grounded in the evidence um, on pediatric bipolar disorder in three key areas. One, the unique symptom characteristics of pediatric bipolar disorder that I mentioned. The second area of research that, it's, that really informs this work is what we know about the brain and how uh, differences in the wiring and the functioning of those emotional and cognitive control centers of the brain really relate to the uh, mood difficulties that these kids experience. And then what we know about the stressors both um, between people and in the environment that these kids and families experience. And so the research in those three areas has really informed the core components of the treatment, which form the acronym RAINBOW. So that's why I keep talking about RAINBOW. Um, and these are the seven main ingredients. You can see how each of these three research areas has sort of shaped the specific ingredients on this slide. But I will talk about each uh, component in more detail. So starting with the R of rainbow, which stands for routine. 
So what we know from the literature is that kids with mood disorders and bipolar disorder in particular experience difficulties with mood dysregulation. And we also know that disruptions in routine or a lack of structure can really trigger or intensify mood difficulties. So the goal of this first component is to increase mood stability and decrease symptoms by establishing a predictable and very simplified routine um, at home. And we go about targeting uh, a couple different areas for routines. We start with sleep. Um, sleep is one of the, probably the most important routine that we target from the beginning. If the child doesn't have a regular sleep schedule, we're not going to be very successful in the rest of our work. So we start there, but also work to develop routines around diet, medications, homework time, and transitions. Transitions tend to be really difficult for these kids, so we work with the families to make them more predictable and more consistent. In addition to making routines, we also talk about adding soothing and release activities into the child's routine every day, um, giving them a place to kind of manage those mood difficulties that they experience. And then a lot of what we focus on then is how to make this work. How do we make these routines stick? Because it's very easy to talk about them in the office, much more difficult to actually implement them at home. And so we talk about ways to post reminders, warnings, and do a lot of preemptive planning to avoid surprises. So the A stands for affect regulation. And um, as I mentioned before, research on some of the neurobiological underpinnings of this disorder have helped us understand why these kids experience difficulty regulating their moods. And so the goal of this component is to increase the child and the family's ability to cope with these mood difficulties and really compensate for some of the difficulties that we see at the brain level. And we do this in various ways throughout treatment. So we do a lot of just education about what are our feelings, helping the child begin to understand and label their feelings and monitor them throughout the day. So what you see here is a picture of one of our daily mood calendars. Um, and we have sort of very simple to more advanced mood calendars to help these kids and their families identify their moods at several points in the day. We talk about the triggers of the mood difficulties that they may experience and then try to identify and build coping skills and coping plans for those triggers. And one of the big things that we work on with families is helping to manage rage storms. So I talked about how irritability is one of the kind of prominent characteristics of kids with bipolar disorder. And it's often one of the biggest things that parents are uh, concerned about when they come to our clinic. And so we work with the family to develop a very specific plan for how they manage these storms and we talk about this analogy of the goal is to put out the fire. So they don't want to engage in behaviors that are going to fan the flames. Their goal is to contain the child, um, increase safety, help soothe the child, and help everything de-escalate uh, before going in with consequences or discussion about what's going on. And this is often um, counterintuitive for parents. They want to go in and um, make consequences when the child is having a really difficult time. We talk about waiting until that behavior stabilizes to try to do anything about it. And here are just some of the different activities that we do with the kids to work on feelings like education. You see that poster on the left. Um, and identifications. So we talk about where the kids feel that anger rising in their body. What are their anger clues? We talk about triggers of mood difficulties. We use the word bugs for that, so what bugs me. You can see that in the bottom left. And then we also work on developing what we hope are engaging in more fun ways to cope with difficulties, uh, like a coping baseball game that we've developed. And here's just an example. It's a little dark, so it's hard to see. But here's an example of um, one patient's coping plan. And she gave me permission to use this. Um, so Sam has developed a snow cone corner. So this is an area where she can cool off. You see she's decorated her room with streamers that are supposed to be icicles to remind her to cool down. And she's created this cool down corner in her room with a comfy chair. The blanket on there is actually like a rainbow, so it reminds her to use her rainbow skills. And then she has her favorite stuffed animal, pictures of Taylor Swift, which she identified as being very soothing for her, and um, a list of her coping strategies that we have developed in our sessions 
and then all the materials she would need to use those coping strategies. So this is a very compliant family uh, that has implemented our strategies at home quite well. So the next component is the self-esteem and self-efficacy boosting component. And we know that self-efficacy plays a very important role in managing mood episodes. We also know that these kids tend to present with pretty low self-esteem. So the goal of this component is to increase the child and the family's beliefs in their ability to cope with this disorder and also to increase their positive self-concept. And we do this through work with the child and the parent. With the parent, we work on helping them recognize, what are my kids' strengths? So many of these parents come into our treatment sessions very stressed. Um, they've been focusing and dealing with the negative behaviors for so long that it's hard to really focus on the positive qualities and the strengths. Um, there isn't time in the day for that. So we try to take time out to focus on what are those strengths and then how can they be promoted through different success activities for the child. Um, how can the parent give positive feedback and pep talks throughout the day, even on really small things, to help boost their child's self-esteem? And then we also work with the parent on developing their own positive mantras to help them cope. Like, we can get through this. We've done this before. With the kids, we also work on identifying their positive qualities. And this is really difficult for these kids. Um, that's often a pretty tough session and takes some guidance from the therapist to help them recognize what their positive strengths are. And a big part of doing this is to help the kids really distance their identity from their symptoms and the disorder. So how, how do they develop an identity that's, that's not just about um, having bipolar disorder? We also work on developing positive coping scripts and skills and applying those, difficult, those skills to different difficult situations. So the next component has sort of a double meaning. It stands for no negative thoughts and live in the now. And we know that kids with mood disorders have very negative thoughts about themselves, about others, and about their future. And so the goal of this component is to decrease those negative thinking patterns um, in the child and also to increase the focus on coping in the present moment to avoid becoming overwhelmed by thoughts of the future. And so with kids and with parents, we work first on recognizing what are the negative thoughts that they have and how does that affect their mood? And how can we go about changing these thoughts or reframing them in a more positive or balanced way to help them prevent that negative spiral of mood from develop developing? And common thoughts that we hear in our clinic are, um, this will never get better, we can't do this, I can't stand this. With parents, we also work on trying to increase their focus on the present moment through some mindfulness techniques. And by that I mean we work on breathing and developing this sort of non-judgmental acceptance and awareness of their thoughts and feelings. We also talk about how they can approach their child with empathy and by taking their child's perspective and bringing their full attention to different situations to help the child really feel heard. And then we work again on developing their own mantras to help prompt the use of these skills. So B is again a two-part component. Um, it stands for be a good friend and balanced lifestyle. So we know that kids with mood disorders, um, and we know from the research that I mentioned before, that kids with bipolar disorder in particular have significant difficulties in peer relationships. We also know that these parents come to us with a lot of stress and strain in their own lives. And so the goal here is to improve social functioning in the child and also to enhance balance and self-care for the parents. And so the way we do this with the kids, we do a lot of training in um, how to make friends, how to keep friends. We talk about what are the qualities of a good friend and we practice them in role play in our sessions. We also work on how you show respect um, by developing better listening and communication skills, developing empathy, and being able to recognize others' emotions. With the parent, we work on helping them identify opportunities that their child can practice social skills. Oftentimes what happens with these families is that uh, the child or the parents have had so many negative experiences in social settings 
that they've started to really um, isolate themselves and avoid birthday parties, avoid sleepovers because it's just too difficult and too stressful. And so we work with the parents on how they can start adding those back into the family routine with a lot of support and a lot of ideas about how to help the child in that situation so that they can begin to have more positive social interactions. And then we also take a step back and focus just on the parent themselves in these sessions and how they can achieve greater balance between caring for their child, um, which is a full-time job, and taking care of themselves. And one of the activities that we do with the parents, um, we call recarving the pie. So we have them develop a pie chart about how is their time currently spent. What percentage of their time is allocated to work, childcare, meals, chores, etc. And then we think about, okay, what is the ideal? What percent do you want to allocate to each activity, and how can we add in greater balance and greater self-care? And since this is going to be ideal and is often far from the real, we also focus on how do we make this happen? What systems need to be put into place for greater balance? Who can you call on to uh, share some of the child care or household responsibilities so you can go out for that walk or can go to the gym? And probably the biggest thing that we do here is working with the parents to accept the fact that their self-care is not selfish, um, that it's an important part of caring for their child. The next component of treatment focuses on problem solving because, um, as I mentioned before, we know that problem solving skills in these kids are often um, impaired. And so we work with the child and the family to develop better problem solving and communication skills to hopefully reduce some of that stress and strain that they're experiencing at home. So with kids, we teach them like step-by-step -step concrete approaches for problem solving, identifying a problem, identifying possible solutions, going through the pros and cons of each, and then picking the best one and actually implementing it. And then with the family all together, we really work on um, the timing and the tone of their interactions. So how to approach difficulties in a proactive versus a reactive way um, by being collaborative and empathic and trying to focus on problem solving ahead of time rather than reacting in the moment. And one of the things that we do with some families is we develop a family bug box, which is a place where everyone can submit their bugs or their triggers during the week and at a specified time when everyone's going to be in a good mood and well rested, they go through those bugs and try to figure out solutions to improve the following week. And finally, the last component of this treatment focuses on ways to find social support because as we found, isolation, shame, or lack of access can really prevent these families from finding or using good support systems. And so we work with the child and the family to identify and seek out good sources of support in their family, in their school, and in their community. So families might come in and say, oh, I have, uh, my parents live here, and the grandparents live here, and we have a lot of extended family, we have a lot of support, um, but those people don't believe in bipolar disorder or think that this is a discipline problem. And so it's actually not a very helpful source of support for the parent. So we work on identifying, okay, who can be more support for instrumental tasks like household and chores, and who do you go to for those emotional needs? So that is the main, um, those are the main components of the treatment that we are studying in this uh, big treatment trial. And as I've mentioned, a major goal of my work, though, is to identify um, and address and adapt this work for suicide prevention. Because as you, as you just heard, I never mentioned the word suicide. Um, that's not one of the components that we focus on um, in this treatment. But this model is certainly relevant for suicide risk because it targets many of the areas that we think are related to high suicide risk in kids with bipolar disorder. But it doesn't explicitly target suicidality. Nowhere in the agenda do we specifically focus on those suicidal thoughts or behaviors. And is that going to be sufficient to really reduce suicidality or prevent suicide in this group? Um, much of the research on suicide intervention suggests that interventions need to be specific to suicide to be most effective. So the goal of my study is then to identify well, what are the factors and the methods that we're already using that can help reduce suicide risk. 
and how can we further enhance our treatment to really target it for suicide prevention. Um, and as I mentioned several times, this is a work in progress. So the treatment concepts for these suicide prevention modules are really going to be informed by the findings from this study, as well as the youth suicide intervention literature. But going into this work, I have an idea of what I want to do in this intervention. Um, and so I can share with you my proposed ideas today and would love to hear your feedback at the end as well. But the goal is to develop three additional modules that would be two to four sessions each that specifically focus on the prevention and the management of these risk factors for suicide. <coughs> it's something that would be that we'd be able to flexibly integrate in our existing treatment um, so that it sort of piggybacks on the key targets that we're already talking about. And so the first module is a suicide risk psychoeducation module that would be two to three sessions. And the evidence for this module is that we know that education is an essential component of suicide interventions for adults and for youth. And we also know that effective suicide interventions, what we know from the literature, is that they must explicitly um, address the risk factors for suicide. So just targeting the symptoms of an illness is not sufficient. So the goals of this first module would be to increase the family's awareness of what do we know about suicide risk factors for children in general, and what are the specific risk factors that their child and their family is experiencing. We'd start off by developing an acute crisis management plan um, that would then be expanded during the course of this treatment to really tailor it to each of the child and family triggers. But we'd start with the most basic of um, safety and basic co coping skills and then develop it over the course of the next two modules. So the second module focuses on family conflict and communication. And the evidence here is that, as I've mentioned a couple times, family conflict and cohesion are uh, related to suicide risk. It's really linked to suicide risk and youth. And so the goal here would be to build on the family work that we've already developed in the treatment to really work on promoting cohesion and reducing those family stress triggers of the kid's suicidality. So, this will include communication. How does the family talk openly about these thoughts? How does the child express their thoughts and how can the parents respond in an empathic way um, to avoid fanning the flames or exa exacerbating that mood dysregulation that we've talked about? Also work on developing problem solving skills to prevent escalation in these triggers. So how do we prevent these triggers from even happening? And then what do we do if prevention doesn't work, and these, uh, how do we acutely manage those triggers? And as strategies are identified, um, they would be added to the youth's management plan. And then the third module will focus on those child factors, um, particularly coping and problem solving. And we know that hopelessness, poor problem solving, and impulsivity or mood um, instability are associated with suicide in kids. So the goal here is, again, to build on the skills that we've already introduced to the family to develop affect regulation strategies to manage this mood instability in their suicidal thoughts. So working with the child to develop problem solving and other skills to come up with other reactions to difficulties um, beyond suicidal thoughts. Um, also really targeting hopelessness through that skill building. So as the child begins to feel like they have a repertoire for managing these difficult thoughts, um, we would hope that they feel a little bit more hopeful about their future. And again, successful strategies would be added to the youth suicide management plan. So the goal is that by the end of this module, the child and the family has a very detailed, very explicit plan for every single one of the triggers that they may experience and how they can use these newfound skills to respond. Okay, so I've talked to you about the background and what, um, what I hope to do with the intervention and the intervention that we're currently delivering. So now I wanted to present um, some very preliminary results on the sample to date. And this is just an overview of who is in our study. So as I mentioned, the study is for kids ages 7 to 13, but it's a young sample. It's a mean age of about 9. We have slightly more males than females. 
Um, and it's fairly diverse in terms of racial ethnic composition. And this is uh, pretty characteristic of our clinic and the population that we serve. Um, we have the full spectrum of bipolar diagnoses represented, although the majority of the kids meet criteria for the bipolar, not otherwise specified category. And we see a lot of comorbidities, so a lot of co-occurring disorders, um, with about a third of the sample also meeting criteria for anxiety disorder, uh, about half meeting criteria for ADHD, and a third for oppositional defiant disorder. That next line about the illness severity, this is a scale that ranges from 1 to 7, and so the mean illness severity of these kids coming into the study is a 4, which indicates, indicates a moderate degree of severity. And same with the global functioning score, that indicates um, a fair amount of impairment in these kids. So this is a pretty complex sample, uh, representative of the pediatric bipolar disorder population in general. Okay, so starting with some of our findings. This is a little difficult to see, but this pie chart um, shows the most severe type of past suicidal ideation that these kids report experiencing when they come into our study. So as you see, 37% of the sample reports no history of suicidal thoughts, um, which means that the rest of the sample does. The biggest is um, about a quarter of the sample reports experiencing passive ideation only. So I've thought, I've thought about, um, I, I, I wish I was dead, I, it would be better if I didn't wake up. And then the remainder of the sample has had more active suicidal thoughts. 13% um, reports active suicidal thoughts, so I want to kill myself. Um, the next percentage, which is 13%, reports having thoughts with method. And then the remaining 10% report having thoughts with method and or some sort of plan and intent. So that's lifetime suicide risk. But remember, these kids are young. They're nine. So um, they haven't, there, there isn't that much to their life. But we also look at current rates. And I define current as suicidality experienced in the past month. And we still see really high rates. So 40% of the sample is reporting experiencing any form of suicidal thoughts in the past month. And 30% of the sample comes in having had active thoughts in the past month. So um, the take home here is that suicidal ideation tends to be the rule rather than the exception, even in these young kids. Looking at lifetime suicidal behaviors, um, this is less prevalent, so 60% of the sample about has no history of suicidal behaviors, but that means that 40% of the sample, 41%, does, including um, actual attempts, interrupted or aborted attempts, and then preparatory acts or behaviors. So as I mentioned, one of the, the first goal of my study is to look at what are the risk factors that are associated with suicide before treatment. Um, and so this chart shows some of the demographic, um, child cognitive, and the family factors um, that we looked at among kids with no history of suicide as compared to those with, or no current suicidal ideation compared to those with any current ideation any active ideation, so that's a little more severe, and any severe ideation, which means um, having a method and intent. So I know this is a busy table. I'm going to highlight some of the key things to you. So first of all, we found that age and gender are not related to suicide risk in this sample. Um, but not surprisingly, we found that kids with current suicidal ideation have higher rates of current depressive symptoms. We also see that they report lower quality of life. Um, but mania symptoms were not found to differ between kids with and without suicidal ideation. Looking at some of those cognitive factors, we found that kids who are experiencing suicidality uh, report more hopelessness. But their coping skills, surprisingly, didn't differ from peers without, a hist without current suicide. And then last, looking at the family, we found that the family factors were really important. That uh, parents of kids with current suicidality report greater parenting stress. And that really reflects stress like in the parenting relationship and stress in the home. 
and also greater difficulties with family coping. And one thing that got left off this table is that we also saw greater levels of family chaos uh, in kids with current suicidality. Okay, and so what happens to these kids across treatment? So this graph is, uh, it's, it's on a very small sample because it includes those who have finished the study through the six month follow up and the study is still going on, so it's not the full sample. So this is the part I really wanna stress, this is very preliminary, um, but we looked at the ideation severity for those in the rainbow treatment as compared to the control treatment as usual from the beginning of the treatment to the end of treatment to the six month follow up. And as you can see here, all youth thankfully improve over time. But those in the experimental sample, just by chance, started off worse, but they end up better. So we see steeper patterns of change, and we see better long-term outcomes at the six-month follow-up. So these findings are really promising. So to summarize the findings from this study, we see first that suicidality is very prevalent even in this young sample. And so these findings really stress the importance of not only assessing or looking at suicide in these kids, but addressing suicidality in this population early on before these youth progress to more severe behaviors. So what I've talked about mostly is about suicidal thoughts. Um, and you know the, the funding for suicidal studies, they really want you to be looking at suicidal behaviors. But what I propose to AFSP is that we want to catch these kids early on while they're still just thinking about this and while we can actually do something about it. We also saw that several of the factors that we thought would be associated with suicide were indeed associated with suicide risk at baseline. And these might be some of the factors that we can target through treatment to really change suicide risk across treatment. We saw that our treatment certainly has poten potential for improving suicide, particularly looking at those long-term outcomes compared to a control treatment as usual, um, which really uh, paves the way for the future goal to develop and to test this targeted module for suicide prevention. So, that's all that I have for you today, but thank you so much. Thank you to AFSP for funding this study, uh, to NIMH for funding the larger study that this is an add-on to, and thank you guys for your uh, attention today and for coming out here. And I'm happy to take any questions at this point that you guys have about my work and where I'm going with it. How were the individuals that were identified as a pediatric uh, bipolar, mm -hmm. identified as being in need of care. Uh, and do you have any idea how many are out there who haven't been so identified? Uh, that's specific to your study, but the, the background for my question is that uh, I've had the misfortune, it's not a misfortune, I've had to hear parents of young people mm -hmm. say, my son, my daughter, it's usually my son, took his, her life, and we had no idea this was coming. So, so I guess the question is, um, how, do, how do people at risk get identified to the point where uh, appropriate care can be delivered? That's a great question. You know, that's, that's why I put up those slides in the beginning about some of the literature that's out there that really adds to the confusion around this disorder because many of these kids are not coming in for treatment and aren't being correctly identified. Um, those who come to our clinic, because it is that specialty care clinic, um, we tend to be a last stop for these families. So they've already been to other community providers, other treatment providers, or their school is sending them saying, we know this kid is in need of help and we think that it need, this child needs this specialized care. Um, but I think there is a great, you know, I think the majority of these kids are not being captured, certainly not early on. Um, these are the kids who um, wind up in the juvenile justice system or develop substance use problems or go on to even more severe and morbid long-term consequences because they weren't correctly identified at the beginning early on. So I don't have a specific number, but I can tell you that that's a significant problem. And, um, you know, I think we're only catching a small 
proportion of these kids in this work. I've been told um, that, at least in adults, the suicide risk is highest at the end of the depression when the mania starts coming, so you get your motivation back but you're still depressed. Yep. Is that true for pediatrics as well? So that's a great question. Um, the difficulty in kids with bipolar disorder is that, as I uh, was talking about in the beginning, these kids don't have those discrete periods of depression followed by mania. They tend to cycle between depression and mania up to once per day. So what we found in kids is that, um, well actually not a lot has been done looking at kids, but it's thought that just the greater mood instability, so the more cycling these kids are experiencing, um, the more shifts and fluctuations between mood, the greater the suicide risk. Um, so that's what I'll be looking at in this work as well. Because we don't see that period of deep depression followed by the motivation jump. The information that you have for the children at that age, mm -hmm. or adolescents, are you able to gather any information about the parents? Because we always talk about the child or adolescent as a product of their, of their environment. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, in addition to some of the measures that I described, so we look at like levels of parenting stress um, and family conflict, we also look at uh, parent history of um, mental illness, uh, current uh, depressive symptoms and other uh, mood symptoms, and then history of suicide risk. So those are important factors. Um, and actually something that I didn't talk about is we do find that parents with higher levels of current depression um, are more likely to have kids with current suicidality in our sample. So certainly the parent plays a very important role, which is why our treatment is really developed to target some of those parenting factors in addition to working with the child. Um, but in terms of like the, the history of suicidality, that's less a focus of this study because I'm really looking at what are the factors that are present now that we can target through our treatment. Have any of the parents been offended with the fact that you might ask an adolescent if they have suicidal thoughts? Because I I compare suicide questions now to the 80s when people asked if you had substance abuse. Uh -huh. And very few professionals will ask that question. Right. Well, you know, we haven't had that come up too much, although we go through like a pretty lengthy um, consent, informed consent process with the parent where we describe everything that we're going to be doing and possible risks and benefits. But if that question does come up, which comes up in our in my clinical work frequently as well, um, you know, there's great studies and great literature to support the fact that not asking about these difficulties is far riskier than asking. And so I think providing some of that education to parents um, helps ease some of their discomfort that they may have. But usually, I have to say, the parents who come into our study knows that their child has been experiencing suicidality. Um, it's very rare that we have to inform a parent um, during the treatment that their child has experienced these thoughts because they've been aware and present for many of them before. These are all great questions. Anything else? All right, well, thank you.